I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Joachim from Sabaton. And this is Sabaton History. The modern sniper came from World War I. And our song, Ghost in the Trenches, is about the greatest sniper of the Great War. Raid after raid, men charge straight into the fire, laying their lives down for a few feet of ground. It is a costly and destructive tactic. Some men have found out that a single shot can be more efficient than a hail of bullets when directed from a sniper's sight. Like ghosts, they sweep across the trenches with deadly precision. The modern concept of the sniper, like so many other concepts of modern war, was born during the Great War more or less from day one in 1914. Now, there had of course been soldiers tasked with skillfully taking out the enemy before that. In fact, the English term sharpshooter dates back to the Napoleonic Wars and appears in print for the first time in an article in the Edinburgh Advertiser from 1801. That, in turn, seems to be a literal translation of the German Scharfschütze that dates back to at least 1781. You see, the Bavarians and Austrians of the time are already deploying skilled hunters to take out selected individuals in the enemy line. Given the range and quality of their front-loaded guns and the nature of war being mostly advancing formations over open ground, they're still doing this pretty much in direct sight though. It's the development of better guns and more importantly better scopes that enables the terrifying sudden death from far, far away by a single shot. And in 1914, the Germans pioneer the improved tactic by, again, employing skilled hunters, but now equipped with strong binoculars and high-precision sights. Although their guns are at first of average quality, ranging effectively roughly 300 meters, they are soon equipped with the Mauser G98 rifle with a 1 kilometer or about 3,000 foot effective range. As hunters, they are not only skilled shots though, but also experts in patiently waiting out their enemy from a camouflaged position. As the war bogs down into the trenches, these killers soon become a feared and very effective threat. At the time, an average German sniper racks up 40 kills before he is unlucky enough to have his position vaguely estimated so he can be eliminated by a barrage of artillery shells coming down on him and anything that happens to be anywhere near him. With a 40 to one kill rate, it doesn't take long for the Allies to copy the German tactic, so that most units in the trenches on both sides are accompanied by one or several sharpshooters with long-range guns, precision scopes, trained in the art of camouflage, lightning-fast visual analysis, and extreme gun accuracy. Men that will have to leave the relative safety of the trenches crawl into no man's land or even sneak into or behind the enemy lines to deliver death and gather intelligence. You need a special kind of man to do that kind of work, to have even a remote chance of survival. And Francis Pegamagaba was exactly the right man for that job. He was indeed remarkable in many ways. To start with, he was a Canadian Aboriginal, which meant that he was treated as a second-class citizen in his own country. Or rather, not a citizen at all, as Canada at the time did not grant citizenship to people of tribal native descent. It's unclear on what exact date he was born, but it was sometime around March 8, 1889, on a reservation now known as Shawanga First Nation. The newborn Francis is discovered next to his dead mother, who has apparently died giving birth to him. He grows up in an adopted family, who are part of the Parry Island Band, now the Wasauxing First Nation. Eventually, he makes his living working on the Great Lakes and as a musician in a band. While a sailor, he's given a small leather pouch as a protective talisman, and the story goes that his belief in its protective powers is what will soon propel him to superhuman feats on the battlefields of France. But when you look at his whole life story and how he seems to have overcome extreme adversity from the very first day of his life, it's more likely that the talisman only reinforced a natural ability to face danger, adventure, and adversity with almost nonchalant resolve. And then the war breaks out. The recruiters of the Canadian army 
are not really that keen on enlisting men from the native tribes, even turning away volunteers at times. But Francis has his eyes firmly set on joining the war and enlists immediately. By August 20th, 1914, Francis Pegan Magabo is heading for Valcartier, Quebec, the training base for Canadian soldiers bound for Europe. Soon he's in England, and in February 1915 arrives in France to train trench war tactics in the Ypres salient. Immediately when deployed at the actual front, two months later, he's confronted with the first German gas attacks. Now, arriving in the trenches, one of which you see behind me, was by any standards a shocking experience. The, the constant fear of death from artillery fire, snipers, mines, bombardment from the sky, and, and then there was the all-out hellish experience of going over the top to face the enemy's wall of gunfire. Most soldiers did what they had to do to survive and follow orders. Many soldiers broke down or were killed before they could even decide what to do. And then there were a few men like Francis Pega Magabo that seemingly found themselves at home and went far beyond the call of duty at immense personal risk. It turns out that Francis has an uncanny skill of being able to slip through and between the trenches unnoticed. His eyesight is exceptional and his marksmanship is excellent, so he's assigned as the battalion sniper. Now, snipers in this war are also used to run messages between headquarters in divided trenches, gather intelligence close to the enemy line, and carry out other dangerous missions in no man's land. But Pega Magabo seems to be seeking out immediate personal danger as a thrill. At night, he sneaks into the German trenches to stand silently beside the enemy watch posts, just to slip away again unnoticed. He even enters the sleeping quarters of the German soldiers to cut off pieces of the uniforms they're actually wearing as they sleep. Now let that sink in for a bit. The place he is in is possibly the closest to actual hell on earth that you or anyone can imagine. It's muddy, dirty, loud, and lethal. You're under constant threat from mortars, machine guns, patrols, and defense works. Everywhere around you, there is death and destruction. If you do not succumb to the fighting, chances are you will catch disease in the close, unhygienic quarters. And it is the smell of all of this that stays the longest in the memories of the men who suffered in the trenches. It is the odor of thousands of men living at close quarters, their feces and urine, rotting food, molding cloth and decaying wood, the smell of sulfur, carbon, saltpeter, and other chemicals from the fighting, and most significantly, the overpowering stench of rotting flesh from the thousands of dead that lay unburied in no man's land. And in this apocalyptic world, Francis navigates silently, unseen and seemingly untouchable. He is truly a ghost in the trenches. As 1915 passes into 1916, he continues to restlessly stalk his enemy. His incredible service doesn't go unnoticed. On August 26, 1915, he is promoted to Lance Corporal. Now, that's not an unremarkable thing considering his actions, but it is a remarkable thing when you consider his origins. Remember, back home, he's not even a Canadian citizen. But the war is the great equalizer. Soldiers are rated by their peers and superiors on their courage under fire and their actions in battle. Lance Corporal Francis Pegamagabo's service is impeccable, and in March 1916, he is recommended for the Distinguished Conduct Medal. He carried messages with great bravery and success during the whole of the action at Ypres, Festubert, and Givenchy. In all his work, he has consistently shown a disregard for danger, and his faithfulness to duty is highly commendable. Although he does not receive this, the second highest award for gallantry in the British Army, he is part of the first group of 78 Canadian soldiers awarded the Military Medal. He himself believes that he is protected by the spirits, and until the end of 1916, this seems to be true, but eventually even Francis gets touched by reality. It's a leg wound that will keep him out of action for many months well into 1917. 
Most soldiers would welcome this opportunity to stay away from the war for a bit, but Francis is not most soldiers, and he wants back to the front. At first, they will not let him, but he starts a campaign of letter writing to convince his superiors to return him to active duty, and he's back in the front lines by May. The ghost in the trenches continues haunting the German lines throughout the summer of 1917, and in the fall, he fights at Passchendaele. Here, he is again commended for his exceptional work maintaining contact with units on the flanks and for guiding lost relief units, earning him his second military medal. But by now, the war is starting to take a toll even on Francis. Try to imagine it. By now, his short stay in the hospital accepted, he's been fighting more or less constantly for close to three years. He has taken sight of hundreds of enemy soldiers through his scope, enlarged enough so that he can see their facial features, maybe even the last light in their eyes just before he kills them with a shot to the head. Surely he did what most soldiers do, justify it to himself with the lives he saved on his own side. Most certainly he must have had a capacity to compartmentalize and objectify the enemy to cope with the killing. Probably he was able to overcome the stress by an unusual love for adrenaline kicks, but for how long can you keep that up? And how long can your body sustain this pressure? The answer for Francis is three years. At Christmas time, he is diagnosed with pneumonia and sent into convalescence until May 1918, but he returns to service working through the summer of 1918. By now, he is showing signs of what in 2019 would be called post-traumatic stress disorder. He's becoming insubordinate and gets cited for disciplinary problems, but he continues service over the summer, sniping and running messages at, among others, the Second Battle of Arras, where he earns the second bar on his military medal. This is his commendation. During the operations on August 30th, 1918 at Oryx Trench near Upton Wood, when his company were almost out of ammunition and in danger of being surrounded, this NCO went over the top under heavy machine gun and rifle fire and brought back sufficient ammunition to enable the post to carry on and assist in repulsing heavy enemy counterattacks. But Francis is now more of a ghost of himself than anything else. And by early November, he is sent to England suffering exhaustion psychosis. When only days later the war ends, he is discharged back to Canada. He ends the First World War as one of only 37 Canadian soldiers to receive two bars on his military medal and is the most highly decorated Aboriginal soldier in Canadian history. He is credited with 378 sniper kills, which is more than anyone else from any country in the First World War, and he captured over 300 prisoners. Numbers that make it easy to understand that like every man and woman who served at or near the front, he returns changed forever. But true to his nature, Francis, although changed, is not broken. He has experienced acceptance as an equal from men serving by his side in battle, and then returns to Canada, where he is everything but equal. He begins a lifelong struggle for full citizenship and equal rights for Aboriginal Canadians. He serves two tenures as chief of the Parry Island Band and continues his involvement with the armed forces by joining the local militia regiment, the 23rd Pioneers, where he serves as company sergeant major from 1930 to 1936. Francis Pegamagabo dies August 5, 1952, and is buried on the Wasauxing First Nation, close to where he was born. Like many of the rest of his generation, he took the suffering of war that he had endured and inflicted and turned it towards changing the world to the better. Born a non-desirable orphan, he is today, 100 years after his service, recognized in Canada as an important part of Canadian military history with the 3rd Canadian Ranger Patrol Group named in honor of Corporal Francis Pegamagabo. To his allies, he was a hero and at times a savior. To his enemies, he was swift death. To all of us, he should be an example of how terribly personal war is. Break it up, 
And now over to our roving reporters, Indy Nidell and Joachim from Sabaton at Verdun. Uh, thanks, Indy. Thanks, Joachim. Yes, that's right. We are here uh, in the trenches, in some actual World War I trenches. Uh, Joachim, over to you. Well, at the end of every album production, when we're writing the lyrics and everything, there's always one or two songs left that we, we can't find the perfect story for. For us, it's really important that the, you know, the music and the lyrics match. That's cool. And this song, really, we couldn't find anything until you came to our rescue. Me? Yes, uh, we were actually a bit desperate. Okay. And we were scouring the internet. We came across an amazing episode on the Great War about uh -huh. Francis Pegamogabo, a ghost in the trenches. Of course, the hero of Ghost in the Trenches. Yeah, um, if you don't know, my first big YouTube series was the Great War. You should go and check it out. So, uh, well, I'm glad I could be an inspiration to you guys. Yes, it was lovely. Uh, see, we work together. We complement each other. And now, uh, back to you, Indy and Joachim. Thank you, roving reporters Indy Nidell and Joachim from Sabaton, and we are back in the studio. Okay, Ghost in the Trenches, Francis Pegamagabo. Uh, it was one of the first songs to be written for the album, actually the first one, and the first one featuring Tommy as a songwriter, so I wrote that with him. Wow. And this one, I actually started, I remember, it started with a Googling or something. And that's when I knew this is a song, because this is a, sorry for the language, what the fuck moment, how have I not heard about this? And I gotta say, you did a great job on the research, because what was available online, at least when I tried to find some, yeah. there wasn't much. And cool that Tommy got the got a credit for that and stuff. Yeah, I mean it's uh, obviously he comes from uh, you know bands where he's been the main songwriter and singer and keyboard player and guitarist at the same time. Yeah. So we already knew that you know he's perfectly capable of writing songs, but we we didn't know if we were gonna you know be able to write songs together because sometimes you know yeah, different songwriting writing styles don't really match. But in this case, I guess you'll be hearing more from me and Tommy. And here's another bizarre little bonus. When we were filming uh, the stuff at Verdun, uh, I went down to the hotel bar and Tom Tommy was just playing on the piano and stuff. And there were a couple of journalists there and they asked us to play a song together. And I don't know how it came up with this, but one of the journalists recorded it. So I guarantee we can put a piece of it here. Uh, this is me and Tommy doing Frosty the Snowman. <laughs> <laughs> completely, completely unrehearsed. Tommy Exclusive Indy. on the Sabaton history. Yeah. Remember to support us on Patreon, because that's what makes this show happen, actually. And there's a playlist. Cool shit. You want that. And also, don't forget to check out Time Ghost and World War II. And I hope to see you again very soon. Take care. Ooh.